Rajan, Sona, we're so grateful to have you uh, join us today. Again, thank you so much. Um, just to give a brief introduction, Ajahn Sona is the founder and abbot of Birkin Monastery. Born in Canada in 1954, Ajahn Sona's background was as a classical guitarist. His encounter with Buddhist wisdom as a young man initiated a spiritual journey that led him to become a lay hermit in the Coast Mountain region of British Columbia for several years. He subsequently ordained as a Theravada monk in 1989 under Bhante Gunaratna at the Bhavana Society in West Virginia where his first years of training took place. Ajahn Sona further trained for another three plus years at monasteries in the Ajahn Chah tradition in Northeast Thailand, especially Wat Panana Chai. Upon his return to Canada in 1994, he helped found the original Birkin Forest Monastery near Pemberton, BC, and as its spiritual guide, served as its spiritual guide. Through several incarnations, he has since led Birkin Monastery, also known by its Pali name, Sitavana, translated as Cool Forest Grove through to its current and final resting place in a secluded, fully off-grid forest location just south of Kamloops, BC. So Ajahn, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Well, delighted to be with you guys. How, uh, how are you? How's the monastery? How are, how's life up there? Everything is quite lovely. Uh, of course, we're into the second year, almost a full two years of seclusion without guests because of the pandemic. Uh, but it has been a beautiful two years for us. Uh, it's everything. We have about 10 or 11 people usually in residence here in kind of continuous residence. And so uh, everything runs quite smoothly. Now uh, we stay fairly uh, isolated, but that's really not conducive for, for monasteries. And, uh, and we, of course, uh, this, this very medium that we're using right now is, the, is our outreach. And we also have a very large Upasaka organization. Uh, Upasaka meaning uh, lay people who are interested in studying and com committing to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and uh, studying the Dhamma, particularly in gu with guidance from, uh, from myself. And we have set this uh, up, so there's monthly assignments and studies and groups all over the place. And it is quite well organized because they're all over the world. And they have different time zones and so forth. So that that's ongoing as well. So we, we have a basic outreach to large numbers of people. And of course, our YouTube um, process is uh, happening as well. Yeah. Yeah, I have. Uh... I know several uh, people in our community who are part of the Upasaka program, and it seems like one skillful means to address a situation I heard you refer to recently on a talk where people have one foot in the monastery and one foot on a banana peel, which I thought yes. was a great way of putting it. So, right. yeah, any any well, advice for people in that situation, Ajahn? <laughs> well, there's so many. This is the, you know, this halfway situation is just very familiar. I've had so many people come through the, you know, thousands and thousands of people have come through the monastery over the la last, uh, what is it, 25 years I've been in the West. I, you know, right back to even before I was a Theravada monk, I was in a monastery in, uh, in Toronto, a Korean Zen monastery. And um, there's a whole generation of people who passed through these. And, and this is the thing that's a little different than the time of the Buddha is that we have accommodation for lay people and stewards in the monastery. And they, they come into the monastery for extended periods of time or go on retreats at monasteries or retreat centers. And this, that kind of situation wasn't the case at the time of the Buddha. And if you do, even if you spend a couple of weeks in a monastery or in a retreat, you come out the other side and you're not the same. <laughs> and the, and there's question marks over your head after what have I done here? You know, like I have, I've changed and I'm not quite sure how to handle these changes. And the world that I was taking for granted before is no longer being taken for granted. 
So I think a lot of people experience this and they don't know what to do about that. And I've been puzzling over it for a long time. I mean, decades, how do you set up some, how can you help uh, people who are sort of in the middle? So uh, again and again, I mean, people try to set up community, you know, lay communities and everything, but it's quite difficult. This is something you, you begin to appreciate about the Buddhas setting up the Sangha. You know, if you're going to do a spiritual community that's going to last, you're going to have to have really committed individuals who absolutely volunteer to take up this lifestyle and abandon their own private interests, because that's what it takes to form a continuous community. For lay people, they can visit or stay for periods of time as long as they conform to the, the, the atmosphere of a monastery. But if they, when they try to set up their own communes and so forth, like a spiritual commune sounds great. Ah, well, let's go off and you know, we'll have tiny houses and, and get some solar. And, uh, but the, the real trick is like, what are you going to agree on? What, what's your standard of behavior? Wh how often are you going to meet? Uh, what, is the, what are your obligations to this community? What, what's your relationship to your, the rest of your family or the outside world? This is, this is really almost unsolvable, this problem, as, as for lay, lay communities. So you see this uh, attempts through history to establish these communities. Uh, the U.S. has done that many times, the, the Quakers and the Shakers and the, and the Oneida communities and the on and on and on. And most of them don't never lasted. They lasted for a period of time, but they didn't. They didn't continue. There's a, there's a very hard to sustain even a any kind of committed spiritual community without that vinaya connection. You know the vinaya commitment. So so Ajahn, if you if people are in the situation where you know not necessarily set on setting up a separate community, but just like so many people in, you know, like you said, they come out of a contact with the Dhamma being changed and yet they can't find a way to align their lives with this new sense of purpose completely. What are, you know, three concrete steps you'd, you'd say that actually can like reduce that level of suffering or, or kind of nausea of, of feeling like you're not living what you need to be living you know and because I know a lot of people they you know there's that sort of idea of maybe I should be in the monastery or a monastic but that's not an option and there just seems to be no peace available for them um so how do they come closer to a sense of peace yeah they they need support and a sense of community and so these virtual monasteries that we're setting up are really uh, great situations. And they are they get to know each other. There's just not that many people around the world at the moment that are lay people and really interested in uh, studying Dhamma and practicing. But there are people, but they're, they're sometimes hundreds of miles apart, etc. So we can connect them in cyberspace, you know. So we have this, we... we they can go to meetings, they can all, they can choose to meditate at the same time, they can refer to the same teacher so that they're on, at the least they can communicate with each other. This is something we do with our Pasika program, I say, this is not, uh, you know, world philosophy uh, 101. This is not multi-religious studies, it's not even multi-Buddhist school studies, it's, it's a very devotion to a particular tradition, but also primarily the, the teachings of the suttas, to become familiar with this, the core teachings, the Eightfold Path, types of meditation, etc., in the in this tradition, which is more or less Theravada or even pre-Theravada. It's the earliest school. I familiarize them with Theravada practices and commentaries and so forth, so they, they at least know about these things. And I give, sometimes I talk about differences from, in, in schools of Buddhism within the, more or less the Theravada, but I want them to establish themselves in a classical training tradition. So they really know, understand what this is. And then if they wish to, on their 
as a hobby or on the side, they can investigate other philosophies, etc. But they should have a core that they are quite competent and knowledgeable about. And that takes a, at least to just to wet your beak takes a year. And then they go on to the next, there's about three years of more training. And, uh, and then they, of course they continue uh, and they can ask me questions and, and so forth. And we have uh, questions and answers and group meetings and email th- sort of things. So it's an ongoing education, but they, I don't, bring in a whole uh, fruit salad of different t- types of teaching. However delicious that fruit salad is, I basically stay with just this core early Sutta Theravada thing. And then they can talk to each other. And when they, when they actually have physical groups where they can actually go and sit with each other, they're on the same wavelength. They have the same etiquette. They have the same atmosphere. They don't bring controversy and disputes into that situation, which is the last thing they need. Because we're in a time of massive exposure to media and it's for what gets views is controversy and dispute. And that's, that's not what people need. And they're all complaining about this exhaustion from this conflict, conflict, etc. So this is the last thing they need. This is harmonious. It's focused. And we bring them in and we explain this carefully to them beforehand. There's no restriction on what they can do in their spare time or whatever they want, but just within these groups, these are the, the themes and the expected behavior and expected type of uh, speech that they, they should conduct themselves with. And it seems to be working quite well. We, they go, it goes one year at a time. So you join at the beginning of a year and then that's closed. Mm. So for, for the next full year, and you have to have gone through a, a full year of training in order to join the larger Upasaka group. So, uh, but people who are interested for the next year can certainly be aware that such a thing is available. Yeah.